I, just, I don't feel in control. Uh, I don't feel in control, but I feel like this is in control. I don't know. Do you trust it? Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> For some time now, the automotive industry has been looking to design cars which are increasingly autonomous, and these driverless cars are now increasingly appearing on the public highway. However, the logical place to develop new automotive technology is of course on the racetrack, but increasingly autonomous or driverless or even AI racing series are making bizarre choices in how they choose to go about motor racing. I think they're actually just all getting it a bit wrong. When you look at the A2RL series you may see what I'm talking about. This series uses incredibly potent Dallara Super Formula cars as its basis, but this is something of an odd choice when you consider why those cars, and racing cars in general, look the way they do and why they are designed the way that they are designed. Modern racing cars are designed primarily around one thing, safety. The very shape of the cars is designed around keeping a human intact in some pretty savage crashes. But when you no longer need the human in the car, then a lot of what's designed into a modern racing car becomes completely redundant. The shape of the nose of most modern racing cars is a good example of this. It's defined by the front impact structure inside it. But without the human in the car, then you probably don't need that front impact structure at all, or indeed the rear impact structure. Then take a look at the shape of the monocoque of the car, the chassis. This too is built up entirely around a human, and it's shaped to accommodate and protect the biological entity within it. Remove that and it fundamentally changes the concept of the monocoque. You no longer need the chassis to be the shape it is. It no longer needs a roll hoop, for example. It doesn't necessarily need a steering wheel or even pedals. And speaking of pedals, and putting Formula Student aside for a moment, generally in motorsport it's not permitted for the driver's feet to sit in front of the centre line of the front wheels, and this rule exists for driver safety. But with no driver, such rules don't need to exist, and this too could free up some design options in terms of the suspension layout and the design of the front of the car. In fact, if you don't need to accommodate George Russell's feet, you don't need the front bulkhead of the chassis to be the shape it is. Indeed, with no driver, the heaviest components of the car could be completely relocated within the chassis. Where do you mount the engine or the battery pack, for example, if you don't need to deal with a person sitting in the middle of it all? It again opens up some intriguing engineering options. In fact, the reality is you probably don't need a cockpit at all. All of the electrical and computational gubbins needed in autonomous racing could be distributed across the car. The challenge then becomes one of mounting the parts to survive the harsh environment of motor racing, the vibration and potential impacts that it will experience. In fact, the whole concept and construction of the car could completely change if you don't have the requirement of having to accommodate a driver. Do you need a carbon fibre monocoque chassis, for example? Or could you achieve the same weight and stiffness target with a different material or manufacturing technique? It could be cheaper, easier to build and maintain. If you use a combustion engine on the car, do you need a modern fuel cell? Or could an old-fashioned metal tank with baffles suffice? Some series have actually already realised this, that a driverless racing car simply doesn't need to look or be anything like the racing cars that we're also used to seeing. While Robo Race wasn't exactly a success, its management did understand that fact, and they understood that the car could be completely different to what we're used to, and they came up with and tested the Robo Car concept, and it looked very cool and nothing like a modern racing car, because it simply didn't need to. The UK Formula Student Competition also understood this, and created its own autonomous car for its annual competition at Silverstone. Not only is it vastly cheaper than a conventional car, it's also very small because with no need to carry a driver or any sort of cargo, it simply doesn't need to be any bigger. If you take a wider look and think why is a racing car as fast as it is, or why isn't it faster? Well, in many cases, racing cars are the speed that they are because to build a faster car would actually be unsafe. It's not because the engineers can't build a faster car. Looking back at the 2001 Firestone Firehawk 600 race at Texas Motor Speedway, a round of the kart championship, is a really good example of this. The race was actually cancelled after drivers suffered with a number of maladies as a result of the high g-forces the cars produced through the circuit's long corners, which had 24 degree banking. There were reports that the drivers were experiencing vertigo, vision issues and disorientation during practice and qualifying, and medical experts 
also voiced concerns of the driver suffering from G-force induced loss of consciousness, G-lock, from the high speeds. Well, you simply wouldn't have had that problem with a driverless racing car. Think about the Indy 500, for example. Remove all of the safety equipment from the car and the driver, and the whole object is already a lot lighter and potentially a lot faster. In fact, a driverless Indy 500 could be way faster than one that involved human drivers. But would it be such a draw to watch? I'm not entirely sure about that. When the Indy Autonomous Challenge was trialled, it, like A2RL, simply used conventional racing cars. They were, in fact, adapted Indy Lights cars. And it wasn't exactly free thrilling and it seemed excessively academic in its nature. And was it really motor racing? I'm not sure about that. But if you did have a super fast driverless car racing series, then you would very quickly hit another human limitation. Not with the cars, but with the tracks themselves. Most race circuits look the way they do and they're laid out the way that they are in order to protect people in the event of a crash. And I'm not just talking about the drivers, but also course workers and even spectators. However, if you take away the requirement of keeping drivers safe, then the tracks already suddenly start to look quite different. No need for barriers or runoffs or gravel traps or even tyre walls if you're not trying to keep the drivers safe. No need for chicanes at Le Mans, for example, or you could race on the old spa circuit. All you have to do is keep the spectators safe, and that's a very different challenge. In fact, if you remove spectators too and just live stream the entire event, then you could create some completely wild racetracks in places never previously considered to be viable or even imaginable. Then consider the sporting regulations, the rules of motor racing. Outside of the short tracks and certain nameless drivers, motor racing is a non-contact sport and that again is mostly down to driver safety. Remove the driver and you perhaps remove the need for it to be a non-contact sport. So you might end up with a very high speed version of BattleBots or Robot Wars and I would certainly be watching that. Even if you don't take it to that extreme level, would the rules of racing remain the same? I'm, I'm not sure that they would. So taking the driver out of the car in motor racing is then a route to a fundamentally different approach to car design, engineering, sporting regulations and even where the races are run. So this is why I'm not entirely sure that basing autonomous racing series around existing conventional racing cars is the right direction. However, if an autonomous championship fails or decides to move on to a different sort of car, then perhaps using existing cars isn't the worst thing after all, as once you take out of that computational gubbins, you're left with a very good and very resellable human-driven racing car. I think overall though, where the autonomous series are probably getting it wrong is that they're trying to imitate a human racing series. But to me that makes no sense. Why try to replicate something that's built around a flawed organic component when you don't have to? And by that flawed organic component, I mean the driver. Driverless racing could become its own hugely exciting and hugely different thing, and that's the direction it should be taken in, purely developing the technology that the automotive industry is developing for production cars. It doesn't need to look like motor racing as we know it. But what do you think? Let me know as ever in the comments. If you've enjoyed this slightly different video, then also let me know. And if you didn't like it, well, you can let me know that too. For now though, thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon somewhere in the pit lane, unless the robots get to me first.